It is very difficult for a successful and beautiful girl to find a worthy life partner. The question is especially complicated if the girl, in addition to her own merits, is the sole heiress of a huge capital. It almost seems like an impossible mission. Polly has always been a daddy's girl, and her bond with her father grew even stronger after her mother passed away during her student years, after a long and debilitating illness. The father and daughter supported each other through her treatment, and even more so after her passing. They formed a tight-knit unit, not allowing anyone else into their world. After a few years, Mr. Matthews, Polly's father, was tired of his monastic lifestyle and decided to find a life partner. There were some women, but none of them appealed to Polly. It wasn't just jealousy on her part. The truth was that these girls were young, foolish, and only interested in money. But Mr. Matthews understood their motives and totally admitted them. After a series of relationships, he finally chose one, Kirsten, whom he decided to marry. Mr. Matthews, being wise, signed a prenuptial agreement with his wife. Seeing her father manage his love life maturely and responsibly, without going crazy from elderly infatuation, Polly stopped worrying and accepted her father's choice. Deep down, though, she strongly disapproved, but she knew that her father deserved happiness, and if he found it with this girl, then so be it. By this time, Polly herself. Had become actively involved in her personal life. Initially, potential suitors fell into two categories: those who genuinely liked Polly but were afraid of her strong character, ambition, and sense of responsibility, and those who were fearless and only interested in her financial situation. Both options were unacceptable to a sensible person like Polly. The girl was deeply upset for a long time, but eventually. She gave up and stopped thinking about it, hoping that fate would intervene. And indeed, a chance played a significant role in Polly's personal life. Just a few months after deciding to focus entirely on her career, a fateful encounter occurred. One evening, a colleague from work invited Polly to her bachelorette party. It would have been awkward to decline, so Polly reluctantly agreed, planning. To leave after a few hours with a plausible excuse, but the chosen restaurant had live music. The musicians, a small orchestra, played exceptionally well. But it was the saxophonist who captured Polly's heart. He was incredibly attractive, and played with such improvisation that Polly couldn't help but be enchanted. Sensing Polly's attraction, the saxophonist announced from the stage that the next composition. Would be dedicated to the most beautiful girl in the city. It was a compliment no woman could resist, and Polly was no exception. The evening continued with a gallant invitation to dance, and a gift of an expensive bottle of champagne sent to Polly's table. This is how Polly's romantic relationship with Albert began. No one anticipated anything serious. However, their relationship not only continued. But also gradually developed. After about six months, they decided to live together, and on the anniversary of their meeting, Albert proposed to Polly. Mr. Matthews, to put it mildly, was not happy with his daughter's choice. He believed that a third-rate musician from a tavern could never match his daughter. But Polly stood up for her choice, especially since her father himself was married to a woman from the provinces. Fine, Mister Matthews conceded, but this marriage will be subject to the same terms as mine. In the event of divorce, or God forbid, your death, your husband will only receive a small portion of your inheritance. Of course, I have already written a will in your favour, and as a backup heir, the city's charitable organisations have been included. And of course, we will have a prenuptial agreement. I'm not naive, Dad, Polly replied. She was aware of all the risks and dangers, and despite her love, she never turned off her critical thinking. Does your fiance know about your intentions? I doubt he will be pleased about this news," sarcastically retorted her father, and he was right. Albert was unpleasantly surprised by this turn of events. Why? We love each other, 
Albert seemed genuinely perplexed. Exactly. If you love me, you should want to protect me, insisted the bride. From whom? From myself? He questioned, his eyes filled with surprise. From any unfortunate event that may occur, life is long. Father sees it as a necessity, and I agree with him. I have had a will for a long time, just in case, and I strongly insist on a prenuptial agreement. And by the way, it is my father's terms. I cannot go against his word, no matter how much I want to. Polly played her strongest card, leaving Albert with no counter argument. He had no choice but to agree, both to signing the document and to the proposed text. Naturally, Mr. Matthews took care of everything, ensuring that every detail was meticulously reviewed by a competent lawyer. Although Albert made concessions to Polly and his future father in law, Mr. Matthews remained dissatisfied by his daughter's choice. Polly is capable and can earn a lot with her intellect, but can a saxophonist provide for his family? Music is undoubtedly a wonderful occupation, but Albert is clearly not a virtuoso. What about supporting his family? And what about the children? I wish he would earn enough for his own needs, at least. Yes, Mr. Matthews had a different upbringing and attitude towards family responsibility. Of course, his choice wasn't ideal either, but he considered that, in his case, it was different. It's one thing for a mature man to choose a life partner for enjoyment when he has already achieved everything when he has lived his life. It is quite another when a young woman chooses such an unreliable partner. But regardless of Mr. Matthews's worries, the young couple had a lavish wedding and began their family life, despite the disapproving comments from outsiders. Not only friends and Polly's father, but also friends and relatives of Albert, criticized their obvious mismatch. How could a creative musician and a pragmatic and down to earth financier have anything in common? It would only become clear in ten years that Albert was not as creative as he seemed, and Polly was not as pragmatic as she was perceived. Nevertheless, the newlyweds lived calmly. One could even say happily, despite everyone's negativity. They found common topics for conversation, shared hobbies, and had an interesting circle of acquaintances. They worked hard and rarely spent time together, but these meetings were exciting and pleasant, keeping the passion and desire to be together alive. At first, Polly wasn't focused on having children. She was building her career, learning from her father's experience, and preparing for succession. Her husband seemed to understand and didn't insist on having a baby right away. However, after five years of marriage, the topic of having children came up more often. Polly realized that it was time to seriously consider it and not miss her chance to become a mother. But just as the couple began actively planning, Mr. Matthews fell ill. His illness was severe, long and painful for him and everyone around him. Understandably, in such a state, Polly was not emotionally or physically ready to plan a pregnancy. When her father passed away, it felt like the light of her life had been extinguished. Despite his prolonged illness, she was not prepared for the loss of her closest and dearest person. At the funeral, people tried to console her, saying, Thank God he's at peace now. Think of it that way, Polly. Polly forced a smile and accepted their condolences, although, in her heart, she wanted to lash out at such sympathizers. This period in her life was extremely difficult. She wanted to shut herself away and not come out under any circumstances, spending her days in bed under a blanket, crying and feeling sorry for herself. After a few days in this state, following her father's funeral, Polly realized that it wasn't a solution for her personally. Such behavior only worsened her depression and intensified negative thoughts. She needed to take action to live and function normally. As a result, she made the decision to return to work on the ninth day after her father's death. Work somehow distracted her, gradually pulling her out of her depression. Responsibilities, tasks and problems constantly arose and needed to be solved. She had to lead people and make important decisions. Polly constantly reminded herself 
that her father wouldn't want to see her crying and having tantrums about him. He would want to see a worthy successor to his endeavours. The period of life was hardly better than the years when her father was seriously ill. Back then she could see him, be with him, seek his advice and simply talk to him. Now it felt as if she was completely alone, surrounded by the rest of the world. Albert was there for her, but Polly's father's illness had strained their relationship and created a significant rift between them. They were physically side by side, but emotionally separate. That's why it came as a complete surprise to Polly when Albert started such a conversation at a rare dinner together. Polly, we have a wedding anniversary coming up, ten years, so maybe we should celebrate it properly, Albert asked, his voice filled with tension and doubt. I understand that it has only been eight months since the death of your father, and we are still in mourning, but I believe he would want to see you happy, smiling. We've experienced so much trouble and grief in the past few years. We deserve a celebration. Some positive emotions. What do you think? At first, Polly was extremely sceptical of the idea, especially since Albert offered renting a restaurant and inviting family and friends for a full-fledged anniversary celebration. Polly didn't feel like it was a significant event, especially considering the strained relationship she had had with her spouse in recent years. Think about the positive memories, the happy moments, Albert persisted. Maybe it will help us become closer again to remember why we got married and how happy and in love we were. Why do we need a crowd of people for this? Polly questioned incredulously. Well, they are our loved ones, good people. They will come, be happy for us, give us gifts and say nice words. It will definitely improve your mood, at least for that day. Look at yourself. You always seem so gloomy. Seeing Polly's nervous grin in response, Albert quickly added, I didn't mean that you have no reason to feel that way. God forbid, I'm not blaming you. I just want to cheer you up. Maybe we can still make things work. I want it so badly, he said, taking his wife's hand in his palm. Okay, Polly gave up after thinking over the idea. But who will organise all of this? It sounds like a grand celebration, which is nice, but it will take a lot of time and effort to plan. I don't have the ability or resources for that. I'm sorry. I understand. And I don't expect you to do it all by yourself. I have my own resources and specially trained people to help me. We'll hire a firm to take care of all the organisation, Albert suggested. So, I'll just need to show up at the appointed time and place, Polly clarified. Exactly. Preferably with a good mood, but I won't insist, Albert smiled in response. Polly agreed. After all, if nothing was required of her, maybe Albert was right, and it could be good for their relationship. What if everything could still be fixed and saved? After all, marriage requires compromise and giving in to your partner. Albert was so involved in the planning process, constantly sending photos and videos and writing to his wife, that she eventually became willingly ignited by the upcoming event. By the appointed date, Polly was already filled with enthusiasm, which infected her husband. For the first time in several years, her mood was truly elevated. The anticipation of a real celebration overwhelmed her. On the eve of the anniversary, Polly even went shopping. She wanted to look beautiful on this evening for him. Polly carefully selected her dress and even booked an appointment at the beauty salon. Unexpectedly, she felt the urge to make a drastic change and dye her blonde hair brown, as well as cut off her long locks. Looking at herself carefully in the mirror, Polly was pleased with her appearance. Her figure-hugging black dress suited her well, and her straight brown hair, reaching the middle of her shoulder blades, gave her a refreshing look. Her transformed appearance surprised everybody at the party, including Albert. Polly received numerous compliments, unlike anything she had ever experienced before. However, it seemed to her that it wasn't just about her looks or herself. Something inside her had changed, due to the anticipation and expectation of something good. The inner sadness 
depression and coldness began to recede, making room for more joy in her life. Those present noticed these changes, which created a noticeable difference before and after. Albert was truly delighted and shocked by the transformation. My dear, you look amazing, he admired. He constantly toasted and complimented his wife, both privately and publicly. The guests also spoke kind and warm words, wishing them many more years of happiness together. The evening was truly magical. Polly felt incredibly happy. It was a long-forgotten feeling and emotion that she hadn't expected in years. She didn't expect to still be capable of such joy. But suddenly, the opposite of what she had felt just moments ago washed over her. Tears of sadness and despair started rolling down her cheeks. Her high spirits were replaced by a sudden collapse, as if triggered by a snap of her fingers. Instinctively, she sought refuge away from the guests, hoping to hide this sudden change in her state and mood. She entered the first door she found and closed her eyes tightly, trying to suppress the wave of panic and fear that seemed to come out of nowhere. Suddenly she heard a familiar voice. It was her husband speaking on the phone. At first Polly couldn't focus on his words. Her inner state overwhelmed everything else. She was about to call out to her spouse for help, but then she caught some of his words. Baby, you know this wasn't just a whim of mine. We talked about this a hundred times. After hearing baby, Polly's heart pounded even harder. If she thought she had been unwell a minute ago, now she realized the real pain. It was as if she had been struck in the solar plexus, making it hard for her to breathe. Only now did Polly realize that she had taken refuge in the storeroom. It consisted of two rooms, and Polly was in the first one. Albert was clearly in the second room, feeling safe with the closed door, and without fear of being discovered. Oh yeah, she's enjoying herself a lot. I wish you could see her. She even dyed her hair and changed her hairstyle. It suits her, by the way. Albert's laughter filled the room. The interlocutor must have said something as his next words followed. Don't be jealous. You know who I really love. Polly thought to herself, Well, at least now I know. It's obviously not me. Although I would like to meet your new favourite. Meanwhile, Albert continued after a pause, speaking to his mistress in a tone full of tenderness and affection. Well, come on. It's only a week left to endure. We've been waiting so long. Why are you so upset? Polly couldn't recall him speaking to her like that, except perhaps at the beginning of their relationship. Stop! Polly interrupted her own romantic musings. What week are they talking about? What are they waiting for? Thankfully, the conversation continued. Did you get the medicine? Everything should be untraceable. Albert bombarded his mistress with questions. Polly felt another blow as she received the words. Thoughts became jumbled in her head. Something that wasn't supposed to be discovered. Are they planning to kill me? When this thought struck her, Polly struggled to contain her panic and horror. No, that's absurd. My death wouldn't benefit them. Attempting to focus on both listening and thinking proved challenging with distractions aplenty. The only idea that surfaced after Polly's husband's last comment was the urgent need to activate the voice recorder on her phone. I have to go, Albert replied to the unseen interlocutor. Upon hearing this, Polly was prepared to silently retreat instantaneously. However, her husband's mistress wasn't ready to let him go. We've already discussed this, my love. Everything is prepared. We've gone through the plan multiple times. Medication, calling an ambulance, psychiatric evaluation, declaring incapacity, guardianship. It's straightforward. Polly leaned against the wall, grateful for the support it offered. Otherwise, she would have crumbled under the weight of such a clear and terrible plan. Thank you, my hubby, for the accessible and concise explanation, she sarcastically muttered to herself, a grin on her face. That chuckle was the only defense 
her psyche had left. Pain, frustration and despair threatened to make her scream at the top of her lungs. Polly gathered the shattered fragments of herself, desperate to remain composed and undiscovered. I understand your worry. I'm nervous too, but it will all be over soon. Albert said affectionately. Polly wanted to storm into the room and revealed that she had overheard everything. But then a thought struck her. How safe would that be? We have been married for ten years, and I never thought he could do this to me. What else did I not know about him? What else was he hiding? Contemplating this, Polly realized it wasn't safe to cause a scene or leave just yet. After all, he was still her husband. What other schemes could he come up with? Polly now knew the main point, and she returned to the restaurant hall. No, I must approach this differently. Polly reasoned to herself, now sitting calmly at the table, not showing any signs that something was amiss. So, they're going to admit me to a mental hospital and declare me incompetent. Well, that makes sense. It's basically the only thing my father didn't plan for. In case of my death and divorce, Albert will be left with nothing, while he and his new girlfriend need money. The woman pondered. There's no guarantee that they don't have another backup plan that could be even more dangerous for me. I need to prioritize my safety first and foremost, and then take action. And eventually, I need to teach this sweet couple a lesson too. I'm not sure how realistic it is to bring them to justice, but something must be done. What would have happened if I hadn't stumbled upon that godforsaken storeroom by chance, at the right moment? Weeks later, I would be lying in a hospital bed, completely incapacitated. According to my dear husband's plan, no, I cannot forgive such a cruel plan. Polly found it unbearably difficult to think. It felt as if her heart and soul had been torn from her chest and trampled on with army boots. Of course, love, especially as it was at the beginning of our relationship, is no longer there. But in a long-term relationship, it should be replaced with respect. And Albert obliterated everything. Cheating is such a small matter. He wanted to take everything away from me. Not just money, but my sanity, my freedom. How can anyone be so cruel to another human being, especially to his own wife? It's inconceivable and impossible for a good, decent person. Apparently, Albert is not one of those people. It's a pity that this realization came to me so late. All right, Polly, pull yourself together. We need a clear plan, Polly said to herself. So, step by step, first, we need to protect ourselves from any harm from this couple. Second, we must teach the dear husband and his mistress a lesson, or better yet, punish them. It was only at this moment that Polly finally realized she couldn't handle this alone. She needed someone who could help, someone she could trust. This is a matter of life and death, so think more carefully, please, the woman reminded herself. This inner monologue was draining, preventing her from focusing, easily distracted by everything around her. Meanwhile, Albert was dancing with someone in the middle of the hall, as if nothing had happened. It's as if 15 to 20 minutes ago, he hadn't discussed a detailed plan to eliminate his own wife. If I hadn't heard it myself, I would never have believed it. Polly concluded, so these emotions are unnecessary. I need to think and make decisions. The entire future of my life depends on it. There's no time to complain about fate. And yes, I can trust only Ed. Ed was her school friend. They had been friends throughout their school years, and even during their time in college. Then he moved to a neighboring town in another city, and their lives took parallel paths. No, they didn't forget each other and kept in regular contact, but distance had certainly affected their friendship. With her purse in hand, Polly slipped out of the restaurant. Once outside, she walked a few hundred meters away and called a cab. She didn't want to linger at the entrance, where her guests occasionally went out for a smoke and fresh air. Polly had no desire to engage in conversation with a noisy crowd, and there was a risk of running into her husband face to face. 
That would be too much. She wasn't certain if she could maintain her composure when looking into his eyes. It's a good thing I have a two-hour drive ahead of me. It will give me some time to recover and gather my thoughts, Polly reassured herself. She sat silently in the back seat of the cab, gazing out the window at the flickering lights, the forest and the scenery illuminated by the headlights. It was her way of trying to clear her mind. Several times she replayed the recorded conversation, and each time her husband's words pierced her heart like a knife, causing immense pain. Yet she pressed the play button over and over, as if trying to truly comprehend that her husband, with whom she had celebrated their ten-year wedding anniversary, was going to commit such a crime for the sake of money. I wonder if he has any pity for me, Polly wondered rhetorically, needlessly torturing herself with such thoughts. Of course, from his tone, it was clear that he didn't care. When the taxi driver finally pulled up to Ed's driveway, it was almost three o'clock in the morning. What a perfect time for an unexpected visit from a school friend, Polly muttered to herself. She even considered waiting until morning at a local bar, but realised that her problem couldn't wait. After standing outside for a moment, taking a deep breath, she dialed the correct apartment. Polly began to worry that Ed might not be home, but then she heard a familiar disgruntled voice saying, Who is it? Ed, please open the door. It's me, Polly. Polly? Ed interrogated, clearly still half asleep. Before the woman could respond, she heard the sound of the front door unlocking. Hi, I'm sorry for coming at this hour, but it's an urgent matter. I have nowhere else to go. Come in. Let's not broadcast the details of your personal life to the neighbours, Ed interrupted. Come into the kitchen. Get settled. I'll make some tea. Or coffee? I just need to quickly wash up and change clothes. Polly obeyed unquestionably. She herself was thirsty and even hungry, which was odd. Well, now tell me about your problem, Ed said, entering the kitchen with a towel in his hands. By the way, I messaged you today, or rather yesterday, to congratulate you on your wedding anniversary and apologise for not being able to come. But you didn't reply. I'm sorry, I didn't have an opportunity to text you. I had a lot on my mind. Everything happened at the celebration, Ed, Polly replied, struggling to hold back her tears. And then she described how she suddenly felt ill, how she found herself in the storeroom, and how she overheard her husband's conversation. That's the whole story, she concluded. Ed had been silently listening all the time, his expression reflecting extreme surprise. I can hardly believe it. What are you going to do? he asked. For now, my priority is ensuring my own safety and taking appropriate action to hold them accountable. Naturally, safety comes first. I don't know their plans or what they might do next, so I need to be prepared to counteract them. Well, while you're here in my apartment, you're safe. No one can harm you, Ed realised. Yes, that's why I came here. It hit me like a ton of bricks. Please forgive me for burdening you with my problems, even without apologising for waking you up, Polly said, feeling immensely ashamed of her behaviour. Enough of that, or I'll be offended. Friends are here to help to support each other. So, since the first step of your plan is taken care of for now, let's wait until morning to figure out our next steps. You need some rest. I'm sorry, but you look terrible. You know, even Monica Belushi would look terrible in such a situation. Polly was a little offended. She understood that the friend did not want to hurt, but her female feelings also required protection, especially now, after the treason and betrayal of her husband. Oh, it was just a bad joke. OK, tomorrow, as soon as we wake up, we'll try to call one person. I think he can help us, Ed said, and then suddenly, as if awake, added, Polly, did Albert call you? Did he write to you? Does he even know where you are? No, I turned on airplane mode on my phone as soon as I got into the cab. Clearly, he's called me hundreds of times, probably as soon as he noticed my disappearance. Just 
What am I supposed to tell him? Nothing yet. Reasonable. Well, let's keep it that way until morning, and then we'll decide what's best. As soon as Polly's head touched the pillow, she fell asleep instantly, but nightmares overcame her all night and morning. Finally waking up around 11 a.m., and feeling worse than before the dream, Polly went to the kitchen, where Ed sat waiting for her, with a cup of freshly brewed coffee. Good morning. How did you sleep? He began the conversation good-naturedly. Hi. To be honest, awful, Polly replied in a still sleepy voice. I'd been having nightmares non-stop. Well, let's start the case then. I had a friend in the army. You must have seen him more than once. His name is Paul. Remember? To be honest, no. Maybe visually. Not the point. Now, he holds a serious post. He works at the law enforcement. Where? Polly didn't understand. Why are you like a little one? He will help you. I say he works at the law enforcement. There are all sorts of services that don't need extra publicity or even a superfluous mention. Oh, I don't care. I totally believe you. And by the way, you don't want to put your own security service in the company on notice as well? Clarified Ed. I don't know who's in league with Albert, who his mistress is. The fact that I'm aware of their plans, they don't need to know yet. Quite logical. Then I'm calling Paul. Polly sat in the kitchen, drinking her coffee. Ed stepped out to talk confidentially, and a few minutes later he came back, quite satisfied. He'll be here in half an hour. The man smiled. He's fast. Yeah, but I don't ask for his help often, and now I said it was an earnest matter. Indeed, not half an hour later, the doorbell rang. Ed went to open it and came back with a man under seven feet tall. Paul. Polly, nice to meet you. Well, tell me about your problems, Polly. The woman began to repeat everything she had told Ed before. Now, everything was much harder on the morning head, strangely enough. Yesterday, it had seemed like a horror movie she'd seen from the outside, and today it was different, much worse. And that's very clever, Paul said after Polly finished her story, and they listened to the audio recording together. What? said Ed tensely. Clever, I say, so you have a prenuptial agreement in case of divorce, and a will in case of death. Your incapacity fits perfectly to bypass all obstacles to your money. Well, it's a good thing you didn't write anything to him out of emotion. Now we need to write him something. Otherwise, he might panic with his lady of the heart. I can tell you from experience that the worst thing is when a man who has nothing to lose panics. No one knows what they can do. Logical, yes, agreed Polly. But what should I write to him? You need to write something non-suspicious so that he can believe it, so that it won't even occur to him that you are aware of his plan, Paul said firmly. Maybe play into their plan, too, said the woman after a short thought. What if we come up with a reason for my disappearance, which will confirm once again my lunacy? I mean, it would be like a trump card for their plan. Polly tried to explain her train of thought. I don't understand, said Ed, confused. But I think I understand, interrupted Paul. But still, plausibility must be preserved. Men are usually fools, but your version will be scrutinised by your rival. I'm sorry if it hurts. That's what I was thinking, too. They're trying to make me look crazy. Apparently, the reason for my condition will be made out of my father's illness and his death. Polly's voice trembled at this point, but she pulled herself together and continued. I'd been on medication and seen a therapist, so I suggest writing something similar to I can't stand it any more. I miss my dad so much, I need to be alone. Polly finished and waited for the men's reaction, nervously biting her lower lip and playing with the rings on her fingers. That seems fine to me. All right, write him all this, and I'll take care of the rest of things from here, Paul said and walked away. Ed escorted him out and closed the door. When he returned, Polly asked, What do you think? If you trust me, then trust Paul too. He saved my life. I know who I'm vouching for. Yeah, 
I'm not talking about him. Paul makes an extremely positive impression, though I shouldn't talk about it now. I'm the worst judge of character in the world. I'm asking in general. Neither you nor I are professionals in this matter. We delegated the task to a man who understands this business, and he gave us guarantees. I trust him. That's all I know, Polly. I'm sorry. I'm just very nervous, Polly said, and then added, "Listen, I saw your bachelor's refrigerator. It's not good to eat like that. How about you go to the store with a list, and I'll cook for you on a large scale." Ed agreed with pleasure because he realized perfectly well that Polly needed to occupy her hands to turn off her head. The next few hours, Polly spent quite actively. She cooked soup, made meatballs, and put them away in the freezer. She also fried pork and even made pancakes. Ed went into another room so as not to disturb her, and when her friend finally called him to the table, he was simply amazed. Wow. Do you often cook so much? No, of course I don't have time. I don't eat much at home," Polly said sadly. Ed reproached himself for asking such a question. He started to eat and praise, trying to please the woman and change her mood, but all his attempts were in vain. Polly only sank deeper into her thoughts. "I'm going to bed, okay? I'm a bit tired. Will you wash the dishes after yourself? Of course." Thanks, Polly. It's delicious. What Polly really wanted was just to lie in peace and quiet, to be alone with herself, and cry. She felt sorry for herself, no matter how ridiculous and silly it sounded. Yes, she was a grown woman who felt sorry for herself, sorry for her ten years with her husband, sorry that it was ending like this, sorry for her life. For about four hours. The woman lay staring at the ceiling in the dark, occasionally wiping away tears. When she finally began to drift off to sleep, suddenly there was a nervous knock on the door. "Polly, may I come in?" Ed asked. "Paul's calling." "Of course, come in." Instantly throwing off her sleep, said the woman in response. "I'll put you on speakerphone," Ed said and pressed the button. "Paul, you're on speaker. Polly is listening." In general, we found out the name of your husband's mistress, the organizer of everything you heard. It's Kirsten. Kirsten repeated the woman, not realizing at first who she was talking about. Yes, the widow of your father. We already know for certain that she is the organizer and mastermind of the intended crime. Albert is only a co-executor. Polly froze. It was a new blow. She had been expecting it, but it was simply impossible to prepare for such a thing. Paul said goodbye and disconnected. Albert continued to stare at Polly, waiting for her reaction. But the woman suddenly jumped out of bed and rushed past, pushing the man away. And the sounds of vomiting came from the toilet. Polly stayed there for about twenty minutes while Ed anxiously waited for her outside. He had been concerned about her emotional state before. But now her physical condition frightened him as well. Finally, gathering her strength, Polly came out and asked in a weak voice, "Ed, would it be too much to ask you to go to the drug store?" "No, of course not. What do you need? What's wrong with you?" Her friend instantly responded, pocketing the essentials. "I need pregnancy tests. Can you please get some?" "Sure, I'm on my way." The man quickly closed the front door behind him. Polly had been trying to conceive for years, going through numerous tests, and she had almost given up hope. And now she realized that she was almost two weeks late, to which she paid no attention. Stress and depression working almost around the clock. Then there was the added pressure of waiting for the anniversary. There was no time for thinking about that. Anyway, there was no doubt that she was pregnant. The pregnancy test was just the final confirmation. Ed returned quickly, seemingly literally running to the pharmacy. He bought six different tests, varying in price and characteristics, determined to be thorough, which even amused Polly. In a matter of minutes, all the tests showed the same result. There was a second stripe. 
Now she knew for certain that she was pregnant. Pregnant with her husband's child, who wanted to commit her to a mental institution and live off her money. Polly felt a panic attack coming on, but she was interrupted by Ed, who couldn't bear the silence, and knocked on the door. Polly, are you all right? He asked quietly and with concern. Yes, the woman snapped out of her thoughts. I'm coming out now. After washing her hands, Polly headed to the kitchen. What's going on? The man impatiently asked. I'm pregnant. What else? Polly replied. Really? Ed stammered. Is it Albert's baby? Of course. Who else would he be? Unlike him, I didn't cheat. Ed looked at her with horror-filled eyes. He seemed more frightened and agitated than the expectant mother herself. And he hesitated, cutting himself off mid-sentence. I will give birth, of course. It's not the baby's fault. He doesn't need to know his father or be told about him. What matters is upbringing, not genetics. We've been trying to have a baby for years, but it never happened, no matter what we did. And now, just one day after discovering who my husband truly is, I find out I'm pregnant. Destiny must have a very strange sense of humour, indeed. I don't know how you're holding up, to be honest. That's a lot of news for one day," the man said sympathetically and stroked Polly's shoulder. "Is there anything I can do for you? You already do too much for me. I don't have enough to thank you for all of your help, Polly. Stop it, please. Wouldn't you help me if I were in this situation? You wouldn't be in such a situation." The woman smiled sadly in response. "You're not that stupid and gullible. I don't like your despondency and apathy, Polly. You've known him for so many years—ten years only in a legal marriage. It is quite logical that you did not expect a trick from him. What's more, you competently laid the straw for yourself. There's only one life lesson in this: that for every cunning person, there's a more cunning person." And anyway, stop depressing. You wanted a baby. God gave him to you. Maybe not the way you wanted it, but he gave him to you. And you're just sitting there sulking. Is that any way to treat a gift? What do you want? Tell me. I'll go to the store, or we'll order delivery. We'll celebrate this news. Ed was so contagious in his emotions, in his joy, that Polly couldn't help but give in. The man brought her favorite cake. And they did not hesitate to eat it with spoons right out of the box. Ed also brought Polly a cute teddy bear as a present, saying that it would be the first toy for the baby. In general, the two of them sat in the kitchen until morning, laughing, talking, and having fun. In the end, Polly felt happy, despite all her circumstances. She was immensely grateful to her friend for his help and support. They suffered without information for almost a week, but Paul did not report anything and did not call them. Ed tried to call himself several times, but only received a laconic answer: "If there is information, I will call." This greatly discouraged both Polly and her friend, but in this situation, nothing else depended on them. It was necessary to submit to fate and wait for results from the competent man. So they were greatly surprised by the doorbell ringing at seven in the morning. Ed went to see who was there. It turned out that on the threshold stood Paul and smiled happily. "Good morning. How are you?" "Hi," Polly called from the room. "What's the news?" "You're in a hurry to get right to the point." "I have news. Can you make me a coffee? I've just got off the road. I've been rushing half the night to get here." Polly, having hastily brushed her teeth. And cleaned herself up a bit, ran to organize a quick breakfast and make coffee. When everything was set up and everyone sat down at the table, Paul began his story. Sorry, I'm starving. Since yesterday morning, I've only been drinking water. There was no time at all. Anyway, Polly, get ready. Let's go back to your place in the city. The investigator is waiting for us. Albert and his accomplice have been detained. There's evidence. And they're already playing a game. Who will give up his accomplice faster? Polly listened to the conversation in silence, afraid to even say something, afraid that it was a dream. 
that she would wake up again in a nightmare, in that storeroom, and there would be no Ed and Paul next to her, and there would be no pregnancy ahead, but a place of residence in the padded room of a psychiatric hospital. Polly, are you okay? Ed asked, noticing the fact that the woman was silent. I'm fine, guys. Thank you so much. Polly forcefully held back her tears. It's early to thank yet. When they're convicted, then it's a different matter. But now you are perfectly safe because they will be in custody until the trial. They can't escape justice, especially as each of them has already signed a heartfelt confession, Paul reported. Then why do I have to go to the investigator? To testify. You're the victim. You filed a statement. Well, you'll file it retroactively, so get your stuff. When Polly went to her room, Paul said to Ed, You talk to her. She's going to have to meet her husband and his mistress. No other way. No other way? Paul, she's pregnant. I'm afraid for her. Is she pregnant by that jerk? Yeah, by her husband, of course. She didn't know. Poor woman. Even though she's rich, well, we'll help her any way we can. Even the trip back to the city was difficult for Polly, not to mention what she experienced at the investigator's office. It was so gloomy there. The investigator tried to cheer her up, but it didn't help. Polly wanted to get up and run away, although Paul had made arrangements, and the procedure took as short a time as possible. So, home? Ed asked when they finally got out and into the car. Where's my home now? Polly interrogated philosophically. Can you take me to our old country house? I can, but why there? Kirsten wasn't there. Albert wasn't there. I want to erase those people and the memories of them from my life forever. I'm going to sell the apartment where we lived and the house as well, and buy a new one. I don't want to bring my baby where that monster lived. Radically, said Ed, starting the car engine. I'll never be able to clean up, and I'll never be able to clean up what happened without it. Stop your wailing, Polly. Imagine that fool Albert wouldn't have been provoked by this Kirsten. He alone would not have decided to commit such a plan, and you would live with him, not suspecting how he really feels about you and who he really is. Yes, you paid a heavy price for it, but fate gave you a child in return. Isn't that a good exchange? Despite the pressing feelings, Polly was eternally grateful to fate that she had a man on whom she was able to lean in a difficult moment. It's scary to imagine what would have happened without him. Ed stayed at Polly's house for a week and helped her with all the difficulties that arose. He went with her to the doctor, helped with documents, went to the investigator. In general, his help was difficult to overestimate. After Ed's departure, the woman had to learn to live alone again. This had never happened to her before in her life. First, she had lived with her parents, then with her father, then married. Now, she was completely alone, left to her own devices. Though, of course, it wouldn't be for long. Not even eight months later, the centre of her universe would be born. All these months, Polly spent her time and energy on business and worries to ensure that everything would be ready in time for the birth of her baby. She put great effort into solving real estate issues and subsequent repairs. At some point, she became so tired of these problems that she began to regret her decision to change everything hastily. However, she was pleased with the result. Everything in her new apartment was done in her style, exactly the way she liked it. Naturally, pregnancy took a tremendous amount of strength and energy, but she learned to accept all the problems and troubles as temporary difficulties. Everything passes, and this too shall pass. The eternal wisdom of Solomon was finally reflected in Polly's soul. She also took a philosophical approach to the fact that she was periodically summoned to the investigator's office and then to court. At first, when Paul announced that Albert and Kirsten were detained, Polly thought that it would be incredibly difficult to meet with them. However, she had to attend several court sessions, where she saw those 
who wished her harm and wanted to ruin her life, and she had learned to take it all easy. Fortunately, by the time she gave birth, all matters were completely settled. She had bought and arranged the new apartment, prepared all the baby things, set up and adjusted her business, finalized the divorce, and even the trial was completed. Polly gave birth to a wonderful and healthy boy. Although the labor had some complications, everything ended safely, and that was the main thing. Both mum and baby were no longer in danger and felt good. Polly named the boy Ed in honor of her best friend. Ed met Polly and the baby at the discharge from the separate house. Along with him, Paul also arrived with a huge bouquet of yellow chrysanthemums, Polly's favorite. Take a look at Paul. He's a good man, Ed winked at her. And it seemed that even without his recommendation, Polly had already been paying close attention to him for quite some time. And he turned out to be a really good man. At first, Paul helped because of his friendship with Ed. Then he helped her through his work, and then through his personal friendship with Polly, visiting her more and more often, and assisting with various small things. It never even occurred to the woman, for the first few months, that this tall man was simply expressing his sympathy in this way, trying to woo her. And so it all started between them. Polly could not have imagined that after such a painful divorce, all the drama, and becoming a mother, she would dive headfirst into a new romance. But her heart told her that Paul was worth it, that he wouldn't let her down or betray her. We can only hope that with Paul, Polly will find her happiness as a woman, build a strong and real family, and finally be happy. <laughs>